Okay, so I guess I'll start now. We've had a few people in here. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased to uh, be here to host this evening's lecture by John Slight, uh, an old friend of mine from my PhD days at Cambridge. Um, before I introduce him, I will briefly explain the series to everyone, because this is the third lecture in a series that we have been organizing as the British Institute at Ankara together with the Society for Libyan Studies. Uh, both the British Institute at Ankara and the Society of Libyan Studies are what is now known as British International Research Institutes, uh, of which there are eight, um, all kind of centrally funded by the British Academy. Um, and we are, as this uh, series is testament to, trying to collaborate more given that our areas of research often had a great deal of historic and contemporary interaction. Um, the purpose of this series has been to provide a historical context to Turkey-Libya relations, which have very much been in the news over the last year. Um, to that end, we had two lectures so far, firstly by Odile Moreau, looking at the context, the Ottoman relationship with the province of province of that constitutes today Libya. Uh, and then by Ben Fortner, who looked at um, the Ottoman Italian war in the province of Libya. Um, we're now moving on to the subject of um, Libya during the First World War, and particularly looking at the role of the Sanusia as they in their um, invasion of uh, British controlled Egypt. And present giving our lecture this evening will be, uh, as mentioned, John Slight. Um, John, uh, after at Cambridge, has gone on to work at the uh, Open University. And he's uh, written uh, his thesis and later a book on the British, oh, sorry, on the Hajj within the British Empire. The title of the book, published in 2015 by Harvard University Press, is the British Empire and the Hajj, 1865 to 1956. Um, at the Open University, he's director of the Ferguson Center for African and Asian Studies and a lecturer in imperial and global history. Um, so I'll now pass to John. In the meantime, everyone is welcome to uh, use the chat feature to say hello, as I see some people have done already. If you have a question during the lecture, uh, the best way to ask uh, it to John is to use the Q&A feature, which is also should appear at the bottom of your screens. Um, and uh, I think that that's everything. Oh yeah, this lecture will also be available subsequently on YouTube um, for anyone who has to step out or if you'd like to recommend it to a friend. Uh, that's all, okay, thanks John, over to you. I'll start the screen share. Thanks very much, Daniel. Thank you, everybody, for coming to listen to this. Um, <clears throat> so, as Daniel said, I'm going to look at, <clears throat> or really try and give you some background and analysis of the final stage of the relationship between the Ottomans and certain groups within what is now Libya, namely uh, the Sanusia, and this is in the area of the First World War. And what I've uh, got, which Daniel's sharing with you, is just a sort of, it's a very basic PowerPoint, but it's it's just kind of a, maps are always very useful to help us situate um, where we're talking about and to get a sense of how that was framed and constructed in this particular period. So what I'll do in this lecture is begin by giving um, an introductory background leading up to World War One about the situation um, in what is now known as Libya in terms of the Ottoman presence, uh, the Sanusia presence and its interactions with European imperialism. Um, then I'll go on to talk about the uh, Sanusia invasion of Egypt and then most of the lecture, and this is much from my um, background as a historian of British imperialism is to look at the British perceptions of this particular episode in um, Ottoman and Libyan history about the relationship between the Sanusia uh, and the Ottomans 
um, and then to sort of reflect on that and provide some conclusions. So to begin, as I'm sure we know, the Ottoman presence in what's now known as Libya has been around since uh, the 1550s. If we fast forward to the mid 19th century, um, what we see uh, with this sort of Ottoman drive for reform and reorganization, uh, we see different administrative structures being instituted in this space in North Africa. Um, this is a process that led to the establishment of the Vilayat of Tripolitania from 1864 to 1865. And from this point, when the Ottomans are trying to reassert their control over this territory, they come up against the presence of this new Sufi order, the Sanusia. And the Sanusia are one of the most influential Sufi orders in North Africa during this period. Now, after their founder, Mohammed Asanusi, returned from Mecca in 1838, he came back to this area preaching a reformist version of Islam. The order spread rapidly across the Sahara and they established um, places called Zawaya. And these are not very well translated as lodges. And they also served as religious, administrative and commercial centers. And initially, the Sanusia resisted this Ottoman reassertion of imperial control. The order's influence continued to grow along with its anti-Ottoman stance into the later 19th century under the founder's son, um, also called Muhammad Muhammad Al-Mati Astanusi, and they moved to the oasis cap town of Kufra, uh, which you can see on the map uh, there in the Western Desert. And obviously in that map, you can see that that is in what was what became British occupied Egypt in 18. 82. And so British officials, they're aware of the Sanusia um, and their, their, their sort of power, their spiritual and temporal power, and they're seen as a potential ally in the region. Now, what happens in the later 19th century is that the Sanusia, they pivot away from resisting uh, the Ottomans to respond to European encroachment in their area of influence in the Sahara. And this forms part of the wider scramble for um, Africa. And this is as the basically the Europeans, they um, move into the interior of the African continent, partitioning the territory. The first uh, European enemy they fought was the French from the end of the 19th century, but they were unsuccessful in stopping the French conquest of uh, uh, the Sultanate of Wadai, which is now present day uh, northern Chad in 1902. And then we have um, from 1902, a man uh, called Ahmed Sharif Asanusi, who becomes head of the order, and he becomes important in the story of the First World War. Now, more significantly, if we could go back to the map, please, Daniel, um, was the, it, the, thank you, is the Italian invasion of the Libyan coast in 1911. And what we have here is two uh, coordinated set of resistances. First, the Ottomans, and the Sanusia, and this is couched in terms of jihad, and they're engaged in guerrilla warfare against these larger conventional Italian forces. And I believe that in the previous lecture in the series, Professor Ben Fortner has detailed that Ottoman involvement um, with the war, and some very significant figures um, in Turkish history were involved here. The point in this lecture to make is that in that war against the Italians, there were very close relationships forged between the Ottoman civilian and military officials and key Libyan actors on the ground. Then when we have the peace treaty between Italy and the Ottomans, this ordered the withdrawal of Ottoman forces, but the relationships between the Ottomans and the Sanusia and other Libyans continued you know, through medium like letters and older networks, including the circulation of people to and from Istanbul and Libya to pilgrimage centers such as Mecca and Medina in the Hejaz. Then we have a very fluid situation in 1913 to 14. We see the Italians try to expand their occupation across what's now present day Libya, but the outbreak of the First World War led to a withdrawal of Italian troops um, to Italy itself because of the uncertain situation. And this enabled the um, various actors in Libya um, to uh, rise up against the Italian colonial forces. And it, this very successful resistance forced the Italians to withdraw essentially to the coast, to Tripoli and the Cyrenaican coastal strip. 
Now, when we come to the, the, the First World War itself, uh, we have the, the, the road to war in August, but for us, the important event is the Ottoman entry into the war in late 1914. And this is very critical for this story in North Africa, the declaration um, of jihad by the Ottomans on November the 11th, 1914. So the declaration of jihad announced by the Sheikh al-Islam is the highest spiritual authority in the empire. It called upon all Muslims who are subjects of Britain, Russia, France, that's the Entente powers, to rise up against their colonial overlords to support the Ottoman war effort. So this fatwa took the form of five questions and answers. The questions asked by the Sultan and answered in the affirmative by the Sheikh al-Islam. And I won't go through the questions, but this is you know, basically a very important declaration which has lots of um, consequences and repercussions, not only in the Ottoman Empire, um, but much further afield. Now, the effect of the Ottoman Jihad has been subject to lots of historical debate, and this is debate that began at the time within the Ottoman Empire itself, um, you know, across Africa and Asia and, you know, within Europe amongst the colonial powers, and it's continued ever since. So in this lecture, I'm not going to explore that debate, but simply to sort of say to you that the call, it did have a catalyzing effect uh, on Ahmad Sharif Asanusi's decision to attack British occupied Egypt in 1915. So Daniel, if we could go to the map of the operations, just so I can give the narrative there. Thanks very much. So this is the situation um, where we find ourselves in North Africa at the end of 1914 to 15. From the end of 1914, we have Ottoman personnel landing on the Libyan coastline and they revive those relationships with the Sanusia along with other local actors. And this was part of an Ottoman strategy that was multilateral. It was local, it was regional, it was imperial. And although we know from our understanding of the First World War in the Ottoman Empire that its effort was primarily directed against the Russians in the Caucasus, the other key Ottoman objective in this initial period was directed against the British Empire. It was the seizure of the Suez Canal. And it was hoped by those in the Ottoman um, hierarchy that the seizure of the Suez Canal would trigger an anti-British uprising in Egypt and lead to the collapse of British power there. And this would sever the key artery of the British Empire, the Suez Canal, which goes between Britain, its Mediterranean possessions, and the empire further east, um, and also lead to the collapse of British-controlled Egypt, which was really a linchpin of British world power. One of the key Ottoman actors in the First World War, Enver Pasha, his strategy, as far as the Sanusi were concerned, the Sanusi were concerned, was to draw them into the Ottoman plan to attack Egypt uh, from, to make the attack on Egypt two fronts. So for the Ottomans to attack Egypt towards the canal and for the Sanusi to act in support of the Ottomans from the opposite direction. And in terms of the Ottoman leadership's exhortations to the leader of the Sanusia, um, we have Enver Pasha and Nuri Pasha. They're, these exhortations, they're couched in terms of this call to jihad, and they also highlight the order's resistance to invaders who are Christian of Muslim territories. And this was influential in Ahmad's decision to decide to invade British occupied Egypt. But this was just one part of the picture, which I'll hopefully outline in more detail later on in the talk. The other thing here is to try and place this in uh, a broader framework, geographical framework. It's got echoes in the other wider Ottoman efforts to enlist Muslims in this call to jihad and the Ottoman war effort in areas on the periphery of Ottoman control and beyond. And these are places as widespread as Darfur in Western Sudan, Abyssinia, Northeast Africa, Yemen in Southern Arabia, and Oman also in Southern Arabia. And in terms of the, the narrative of this operation, um, it begins on the 20th of November, 1915, when the Sanusia, they move across the Egyptian frontier and they capture the coastal town of Solon. 
Now, after this initial period of confusion, when the British, they, they do know what is happening, but they're really unable to deal with it. They gather their forces and respond um, with considerable violence. They deploy a very large campaign in terms of the area of 35,000 troops from across the British Empire, large Indian contingent against around 5,000 Sanusia fighters and their allied um, Bedouin troops as well. There's a series of engagements in the Western Desert and the order is repeated throughout 1916. And as a result of these defeats, most of the, the, the fighters on the San Lucia side, they withdraw um, across that frontier um, and go back in many cases to their uh, villages and settlements. So this withdrawal left the British to reinforce their troops and they then start to remove the San Lucia, the remaining San Lucia fighters from these various oasis towns in the Western Desert of Egypt. And this was completed by March, 1917. So now I'll go on to talk about the British perceptions of the San Lucia relationship uh, with the Ottomans. And one of the first things to say is that there were some British observers on the ground who were involved in the fighting and who experienced that first um, initial invasion of the San Lucia. Um, they disregarded the Ottoman involvement uh, entirely. In their view, it was the economic conditions in North Africa at the time, or rather that what is now Libya, um, that they decided that it was these economic conditions which led many of the people in the area to join the Sanusia Jihad. So we have an ex a, uh, example from Lieutenant Marsh, who became a prisoner of the Sanusia for most of 1916 after his ship uh, was torpedoed off the Libyan coast. And he recounted in his memoir that because of the, the mobilization of um, Sanusia and Bedouin troops, crops hadn't been planted and the population became reliant on food imports. But after the Sanusia attack, both the British and the Italian navies, they instituted a blockade of the coast. And we also see the British blockading that Western frontier. And this, if, if we think about the other blockades instituted by the Allies in the First World War, uh, both against Germany and Austria-Hungary in Europe, and also against the Ottoman Empire um, in uh, what's known as Southwest Asia, um, we see those very terrible effects of those blockades on the population. So joining the Sanusia in their effort against the British was one way for men to provide their families with food because of this economic blockade. And that was something which comes across quite strongly in these accounts. However, the larger sort of issue in terms of these British perceptions is that the Sanusia invasion of Egypt is what they call, uh, and this appears repeatedly in the archival records, is a Turkish German plot. And you see this in lots of other contexts, um, you know, in Sudan, in Arabia, in India, um, it's, it's one of these, these sort of phrases which becomes very embedded in the official discourse uh, of, you know, these British officials who are engaged in this particular aspect of the war effort. So just to give you some examples of this, um, so the Governor General of um, Sudan, um, so Reginald Wingate, uh, he is in correspondence uh, extensively. I'm just going to pause because it's very dark in here as the light goes in Oxford. So I just turn our lights on. That might be slightly better. Um, so he is in correspondence with his colleague, uh, Gilbert Clayton, who is the head of British intelligence in Cairo about the San Lucia. In December 1914, this is just after the Ottoman declaration of jihad, um, Wingate felt sure that Enver Pasha, this is the Ottoman war minister, were exercising what he called a pernicious influence on the thinking of the leader of the Sanusia. But he recognised that the order's founder had previously been very um, anti-Ottoman. So he thinks that, so Wingate thinks that the Sanusia would only support the Ottomans against the British until there had been some military successes by the Ottoman Empire. Now, when we move into 1915 in the spring, Clayton is convinced that there are German and Turkish intrigues, um, which mean that they're trying to draw the Sanusia into this um, Ottoman uh, jihad to attack Egypt. 
And the thing here, they're, they're using this, um, this, this sort of term jihad in slightly alarmist terms, when what they're slightly missing in this, in their analysis is that this is obviously very much a strategic policy, as I said earlier, part of this two front policy. If the Ottomans attack the Suez Canal from one direction and the San Nasir are aiding them from the other, um, this does make military sense. Then what we have is an increased British uh, focus on what is going on in the Western desert. And they have various reports coming in about the uh, Ottoman activities uh, with the San Nasir and also German agents. Um, we see reports that Nuri Pasha, that's Enver Pasha's brother, is present in Cyrenaica and talking to um, the Sanusia, and they're using their presence and their influence to try and persuade the Sanusia to attack Egypt. Now, what's interesting, um, and I think significant here in terms of the sort of British perceptions of this, um, and I'll talk about how that fits into the broader context later, is that they don't see um, Ahmed as the leader of this Sufi order, they don't see him as having any kind of independence of thought or action. They see him as uh, out of his depth. They quote you know, various quotes like he'll find the situation getting beyond um, his control. And we see, so, again, we see these other, um, these other sort of ways of viewing this relationship between the Ottomans and the Sanusia. So we have Wingate and Clayton talking about uh, Ahmed. He has evil Turkish spirits at his side to stir up troubles. Um, and again, these are sort of these very um, Orientalist tropes and notions about, um, you know, peoples living in various parts of the world. And, and, and so it's, it's sort of seen as, he doesn't really have any control over the the situation and one of the one of the things behind these um you know behind these kind of reports and these missives and messages is that in this particular context reliable information was a very scarce commodity especially from the british side and so you get the, these british officials seeing their enemies as this monolithic ent entity uh, these forces of militant Islam, which are being um, placed uh, against them. And also they see that the, um, they sort of create this perception that the Sanusia are being pushed um, by the Ottoman officials present in North Africa um, to doing uh, their bidding. And then we see a shift in the British intelligence reports, looking at the movements of these Ottomans and German officers, um, and now we see that this, we see in, in the British reports that the Sanusia, um, the way it's presented is that they're very much serving the military strategy um, of uh, the enemies of the British Empire. Once we see the attack of the Sanusia against Egypt, once that has happened, in all the British uh, reports, all the, the sort of the starting point of this is that it's all the fault of the Ottomans. Um, and the Germans. And we see reports by people such as General Maxwell, who was the officer um, commanding the offensive against the Sanusia. One of his sort of starting um, uh, proclamations to his troops is that this attack, it was undertaken without the, the knowledge of Ahmed um, Asanusi. Um, and the other interesting thing here in the archival record, there are various letters between Maxwell and Ahmed Asanusi, and this is sort of really fascinating, um, really fascinating material. So you get Maxwell saying to Ahmed that um, the, and this I'm quoting from his letter, Maxwell's letter to Ahmed, is the influence at work headed by Nuri Bey and his German friends is working as far as you are concerned. And we get Ahmed saying something quite different. He's, he's saying that I'm guarding the honor of Islam and our influence amongst our people. Um, and so these kind of very different interpretations of what is going, um, going on. We also see British intelligence um, collecting various pamphlets we're being, which are being circulated um, in uh, North Africa for um, the Sanusia and others to follow this call to jihad. Um, and other sort of, you know, drips of information from British intelligence at the time, which suggests um, that some of these uh, fighters, Sanusia fighters, have been um, bribed. So you've got all these different interpretations um, 
going on. And this interpretation of the Sanusia has, be, has been kind of captured by the Ottoman war effort and Ottoman war strategy. It does continue in a very persistent sense after this particular conflict is over and once um, the Sanusia are in a state of negotiations with the British. So we have this intelligence document, it's called a who's who of the Sanusia, and it's issued by these British, um, uh, British intelligence and it's issued to British soldiers and officials who are involved in the talks between the Sanusia uh, and the British. And so we see the entry on uh, Ahmed Asanusi. He, it's described he was deeply influenced by Enver Pasha um, during the Turco-Italian War, and he yielded to this Turkish-German pressure and attacked um, Egypt. And then next to um, Ahmed's entry is an entry on Nuri Pasha, who was, and this is again quoting from the report, constantly pushing to force Ahmed into hostilities uh, before he had the chance to consider uh, his options. And the successor to General Maxwell in the, in the Western Desert, General Murray, echoed the views of his predecessor when he wrote in a report that the attack against Egypt was due to the, quote, the vanity and cupidity of Said Ahmed, fostered by German and Turkish intrigue. And so the British are framing this, uh, this conflict with within the wider parameters of the British uh, Ottoman war. And this is namely in the sense that the Ottomans and Germans, they're trying to instigate uprisings amongst Muslim populations against the allied powers. So the next section of this talk is really to consider the nature of um, Ahmed Asanusi and the Sanusia's relationship with the Ottomans. What was the nature of that relationship? Now, we've seen in the previous section of the talk that both um, British intelligence in the region and civilian and military officials in uh, Egypt and also Britain itself, they saw Ahmed in certain ways. They saw him as a cipher. They saw him as a, as a leader who had no independent agency. They saw him as a man who had been bent to the will of the Ottoman officers who were in his mix in order to serve the wider war aims of the Ottomans. Now here we come on to the problem, uh, the perennial problem of the historian is the problem of sources. Now the sources that we have on the um, on, from the perspective of the, of the San Osea on this episode, they remain fragmentary and partial. Um, obviously lots have not survived uh, the test of time and we have some very significant and interesting documents between Ahmed uh, Asanusi and uh, Sultan Ali Dinar of Darfur, uh, which do shed some light on the nature of the conflict, but they are more focused on uh, the relationship between those two particular actors and you know facilitating trade and other um, you know other sort of relationships between those two uh, figures so it doesn't necessarily shed that much light on what we're talking about um, today. Now as far as the Ottoman sources are concerned I mean this is this is something which uh, from my perspective I know virtually nothing so if if anybody uh, does have any information on, on this about the Ottoman relationship with the Sanusia in this period of the First World War, I think that'd be really uh, fascinating to um, hear about. Having said that, what we do know from the archival record is that the surviving archival record, I think the Ottomans did play uh, an inf influential role um, in the Sanusia's decision and their, you know, their carrying out of this jihad against British occupied Egypt. And here it may be useful um, to look at, perhaps think in a, in a, in a counterfactual way. Now let's, let's, let's speculate that what would have happened if the Ottomans hadn't arrived uh, back in North Africa at this time during the First World War and, and there were no Germans there either, would the Sanusia have actually attacked Egypt? I think the answer is probably not. I think they probably would have continued to focus on their ongoing jihad 
against the Italian colonial occupiers. And the reason for saying that is that from 1913, the Sanusia had had considerable success against the Italian forces. They'd overturned the initial Italian gains of the 1911-1912 war, and they basically pinned the Italians to several points on the North African coast. And the, the, the attack eastwards from their perspective to Egypt was a distraction from those very real gains of, of getting rid of this Italian colonial presence. So while this episode in Turkish and Libyan relations, we have to understand it in the context of the World War, and we have to understand it in terms of the Ottoman struggle against the British Empire, I think we have to place this um, into other contexts. Um, and those are related to the context of North Africa, um, the context of um, Islamic relations with European imperialism. And, and so I think by putting it in this broader context, um, and I'm going to be straying now slightly outside um, sort of the, the topic, the brief, as it were, of the, the lecture. I think it's always important with these things, um, as, as Daniel said as, at the beginning, I mean, there's Turkish and Libyan relations are very much in the news for justifiable reasons, but we do need to understand the historical background to these things, but we also need to understand the historical background um, to these things beyond, you know, the particular confines of, um, you know, a, a particular topic. So I just want to sort of do the last part of the talk by placing what I've just said, you know, the, the Sanusia and the Ottomans uh, and the British in the First World War in those, those few years in a wider context before offering some conclusions. So we have the Sanusia in this broader context, they are a, a, a reformist Sufi order, and they've been involved by the time we get to 1915, they've been involved in decades of militant reaction to the encroaches of European imperialism on their area of control uh, and influence. And they had this uh, resistance to European imperialism, it's couched in the traditional religious terms of jihad. And so we need to see this 1915 attack on Egypt in its wider religious and ideological con context. We can't see it only as a sideshow of the First World War in the Middle East. So we have to see if we look, um, if we look at the map um, on, the, on the slide, we see how the order has been fighting across a very wide geographical area in North Africa for decades. They first encounter the French who are encroaching on their spheres of influence in the south from the end of the 19th century and they end up, the French end up pushing the Sanusia out of the central Sahara in the early 1900s. So they've had this bitter conflict with the French first of all. Then only a few years later the Italians arrive on the northern shore of North Africa in October 1911 and then the Sanusia they're engaged in uh, initially unsuccessfully fighting these Libyan, uh, sorry, these Italian invaders. Um, but then after we get the, the, the peace treaty, which they had close cooperation with the Ottomans against the Italians, they continue to resist the Italians and they have success, as I said, in 1913, 1940. And Ahmed Asanusi, as the leader of the Sanusia, He's, he's you know, centrally involved in all these struggles um, and he's viewing this in these very strict re religious terms as a jihad. And again, we come to this, this, this broader context is that this type of resistance, it reflects this broader trend of Muslim leaders who they have their religious prestige and they have support from amongst the local population and they try to challenge European imperialism. And this is something which is happening in Africa, in lots of places in Africa in this period, 
um, and it, it, it continues. It's, it's also happening during the First World War. It's also happening in, in other places. So we need to place uh, what the Sanusia are doing and what the situation is um, in what is now present day Libya as part of this broader, uh, a broader understanding of the encroach of European imperialism on all these different parts of the world. The other context here is that we need to understand how the Sanusia are interconnected to other parts of um, of the Muslim world. And this is, you know, in spiritual terms, in intellectual terms, in, in commercial terms. The Sanusia were part of this cluster of Sufi orders who had their origins in Arabia. They were an important actor in the reform and the revival of Islam that spread throughout the Muslim world from the early 19th century. And we can see this uh, story replicated with um, differing degrees of success by other Sufi orders in, in West Africa, in East Africa, in South Asia, in Southeast Asia. So again, we need to sort of see the, the, the Sanusia not just within the confines of what is now Libya alone. We need to see how they, they fit into this broader reform and revival of Islam and what effect that has on the politics and, and society um, of the particular areas in which they're operating. The other crucial thing um, about the Sanusia, and this is sort of going against this British view of, um, you know, them being a cipher and having no independent agency or freedom of action, or they're just sort of, they're, they're, they're a, a pawn that can be used for Ottoman aims. We need to remember that the Sanusia have a very sophisticated organization and their Zawaya, their, their Know, again, the translation is imperfect, these lodges, the use of those in various ways, politically, economically, militarily, they are a very sophisticated organisation that are able to engage in this defence against European imperialism in a way that is, um, you know, quite remarkable if you look at the examples of, say, other Sufi orders versus European imperialism um, in this period, in this late 19th century period of this, you know, this wider kind of global encroachment of European imperialism. So I've got a few minutes left, so I'll just conclude with some, you know, thoughts about, again, wider context and consequences and thinking about this particular episode, which is, um, takes place over a short period of time, but I think has it does have important consequences for Turkish-Libyan relations. So once Britain has defeated the Sanusia invasion of Egypt, we see a decline in the order's influence in these oases of the Egyptian um, Western desert. Um, so these are you know, places like, as you can see on the map, you've got Kufra, Farafra, Siwa. Once the Sanusia have been ejected from these places, Sanusia influence certainly dissipates. Ahmed Asanusi, the, the, the leader of the order, he's shunted out of power as a result of this defeat. Um, and, you know, without giving you the rest of his life story, he ends up dying in Medina in 1933. Now his cousin, uh, Idris al-Mahdi Asanusi, takes over the leadership of the order and he enters into negotiations with Britain. And this is the beginning of the establishment of an alliance uh, with the British that would last for almost um, 50 years. And in these initial diplomatic um, and other negotiations, it gives the Sufi order this de facto diplomatic um, status, which I think is very uh, significant. Now, obviously, the Italians are still, despite being pinned back um, by the Sanusia um, to the coastline, there is a set of negotiations between the British and the Italians. Obviously, the Italians join the Allied side in the war. Um, so there are these tripartite negotiations between the British and uh, the Italians and the Sanusia. And there's an agreement uh, called the Akrama Agreement in April 1917. 
Now this leaves most of inland, inland Cyrenaica under the control um, of the Senusia. The other important thing um, for our purposes is, is that it says that there should be no Ottoman forces, military or civilian, or any Ottoman officials or agents, they shouldn't be present in the area. And as part of the enforcement of the agreement, um, we see Idris, he arrests and he expels a number of Ottoman agents, and he also instigates patrols on the border between Sanusia controlled Cyrenaica and Tripolitania to prevent Ottoman agents from entering uh, his territory. More importantly, Idris, he repudiates Ottoman authority over this area. So I think here then lies the broader significance of what has been seen in some of the historical scholarship as a sideshow of a sideshow in the First World War. What we're seeing here is the formal end of nearly four centuries of an Ottoman presence in what is now present day Libya. So this is really an important turning point in Turkish and Libyan relations. But I think also, I would argue, as a scholar of imperialism, this is also a significant moment in this broader phenomenon of what we call decolonization. And so again, this is why it is, I think it's really important to see these things in the, the, their local context, their specific context, but also to see how they fit um, into these bigger pictures. And often, you know, what we do see is that this, these stories of decolonization, it's the end of the British Empire or it's the end of the French Empire. Um, but I think what is happening in Libya here, that is really an important story in that broader phenomenon of decolonization, but also it's it's something which has um, it has its resonances, it has its echoes. And, you know, as, as people um, more knowledgeable than me know, it, 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 ha it works its way through Turkish and Libyan relations, you know, as the Libyan state develops, you know, after this period in the First World War, then obviously there's the, um, you know, the, the enormous disruption of the Second World War, you know, you've got the Italian colonial presence in the 1930s, you've got the Second World War and then what happens afterwards and how the Libyan state is uh, constructed and reconstituted. And again, all these things they have, um, it's an important strand to consider. And I think again, without wishing to stray um, into the present day, um, there is a heavy hand of history on this story, and I think it is very important um, in terms of understanding that history um, in order to inform you know, how we engage with what is happening between Turkey and Libya in the present day. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, John. Um, that was very interesting. And you know, you really tied this like micro history of this campaign to much broader questions um, in imperial history and also in the history of, of this region and the history of, of Islam. So there's a lot to think about. Um, people are welcome now. We have some time to, to, for John to answer questions. So if you'd like to use the Q&A box um, to, uh, to pose your questions, I'll, I'll then uh, read those out to John so that he can uh, answer them. Um, which, which, sorry to um, interrupt you, Dan. Shall yeah. I start? Um, shall I start with answering some of the questions um, that we've already? Got yeah, we had some in the chat, so I'll I'll read them out so that um, you know, so that people don't, so everyone knows what page we're on. Yeah. Um, so this is from uh, Russell McGurk. He writes that regarding your query about sources on Ottoman Sanusi relations during this period. Do you know Jafar al Askari's memoir? The English translation is called A Soldier's Story. Jafar was general in command of Sanusi and Ottoman forces during the invasion of Egypt. Yes, and yeah, this is, yeah, I'm quite, um, well, I'm very privileged that Russell's here because his, obviously his, his book is really the, 
Um, I'm very much an interloper uh, to this story. Um, and his book, The Sanusi's Little War, is really, I think it's the essential reading, um, the essential reading on the conflict. Um, and I think, yes, yeah, so I am aware of um, Ascari's, Ascari's book. And I think the other, I mean, the other thing, just to sort of say, hopefully something that ties in a bit, you know, to a bit more broadly is that Ascari is one of those figures. And, and again, we see this and I'm, I'm not sure whether um, Ben Fortner talked about this, but there's this amazing circulation of these Ottoman um, military men around the empire within the First World War and afterwards. And there's a um, there's actually a great book called, uh, by Michael Provence called, um, I think if I remember it correctly, it's called The Last Ottoman Generation, which is about this generation of, um, you know, officials and military men who they kind of come of, of age in those final years of the empire. And then you sort of see them um, in all these very different, um, these very different contexts um, and really playing this, you know, these really these crucial roles in all these different, um, you know, all these kind of different national and, 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 and regional contexts. And I, and I think it's the, you know, I, I think this is the other thing which, which makes this a particularly, um, you know, I think it's really valuable to have this, you know, framing it in terms of these Turkish Libyan relations, because you, you could obviously have it, you know, Turkish Iraqi relations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's this, it's this circulation of um, people at this particular time of, of huge sort of, you know, tumult and bloodshed, et cetera. But these, you know, the sense of these connections and circulations and then how that, um, you know, the, how that really, um, you know, how that really sort of impacts on, um, on what happens, on what happens subsequently. So, so I think that, I mean, one of these things is that perhaps this is sort of a, not, not to give people homework, but to sort of think about the, you know, how people both on the Ottoman side and, and the Libyan side, how they use these connections in that post-war period and how they move around and how they, you know, then forge new connections. So that's a very rambling answer, but I hope that's of use to people thinking through these things. Yeah, that's actually, I mean, interestingly, something that, that obviously has come up in all of our lectures in this series is this uh, transfer of, of personnel. And um, I mean, Odile Moreau mentioned how, you know, the, the importance of the, the Hamidian kind of military academies and tribal school in Istanbul in, in, in attracting um you know notables from um Serencia and Tripo Tripolitana um and then of course uh, Ben Fortner's main focus was you know people going in the other direction Ottoman officers mm -hmm. Turkish Ottoman officers who traveled to to Libya during the con Italian conflict so that's definitely a yeah a theme of this series I suppose and like you said could be equally is equally true of the Ottomans' relations with many of their other uh, provinces. Um, okay, I, I also have a question actually, which is I was interested to know what the British uh, counter argument and counter propaganda is. I mean, presumably they're also trying to raise auxiliary forces from amongst the local population of this of the of Western Egypt or even of the you know of the Nile. Um, Valley, um, how are they uh, countering the, the the call to jihad, and and how are they trying to convince uh, Egyptians or Berbers or or Bedouin to go against the command of the of the caliph? Well, I, I think with the um, yeah, so I think with that, there's 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 well, there's two parts to the answer, which is first that because. Once you have the the advances of the Germans in the Western Front, um, and then the entry of the Ottomans, you have all these troops rushed from India to counter both those. And what we see with it's one of those things where it's, it's it it ultimately comes down to timing rather than careful planning. Is that you have these. Australian, New Zealand um, and Indian troops, which are just there in Egypt at the time, and the Sanusia, they invade 
at the time. And so then, you know, these troops, which are destined for other theatres, they end up being thrown against um, the Sun of Seer. I mean, it's it's also, you know, it's it's also a question of that the, you know, the nature of, you know, the, the terrain, the topography, the warfare is, is that if we think about these, well, I mean, to take a, the sort of Turkish perspective, you think about these titanic struggles in, in Northeast Anatolia and the Caucasus, um, what we're looking at here is, is the number of forces involved are much, um, you know, they're much smaller. And so the, 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 the British, they're able to rely on, um, you know, what are called like the British Empire forces. Um, and obviously, you know, as we know, uh, the, the Egyptian army is sort of mandated to not engage in military operations as part of the, the sort of the British uh, induced arrangement of what happens in Egypt at the time. So they're not really. So I guess the thing is, they're not really kind of looking to, you know, th there's no sort of levy of local people against, um, you know, what what the Sanusia are trying to do. I mean, as far as the as far as the propaganda goes, um, I mean, what I and I've written about this in other places in terms of, you know, the reaction to this Ottoman call to jihad is that they're much more, um, you know, both the British and the French, they're much more focused on um, the, you know, these kind of urban centres, because these are obviously the places where um, in the run up to the First World War, um, they've had more sort of issues to deal with. So. The, the, the sort of the counter propaganda in, you know, these places like the Western Desert is actually very limited. It's like what we see is that um, it's this much more basic stuff as a, it's not so much propaganda as just kind of giving people food. I mean, it's not very much food because the priorities are inevitably elsewhere. So you, so you sort of it's 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 one of those things where, again, it's this situation where the British initially see something might happen from the Western Desert, but they don't really know what. Then it happens, and then they're reacting to it. Um, but again, their their focus is, yeah, their their sort of focus is is elsewhere. Um, so this this kind of I know it's been written about in other places. This in I think a bit too grandiose terms. These kind of global counter propaganda campaigns against the Ottoman um, Jihad. I think it's much more contingent, it's much more limited in the specific context that we're we're talking about. I see. I was wondering if they try and use the uh, Azar, for example, as a you know counter authority. I know that, you know, in the period I work on after the First World War, they are very keen in, you know, in in getting um Egyptian Islamic authorities to sort of denounce Bolshevism but that's probably a lot easier than than making a claim against uh an Islamic figure like the Sultan well I, I think the thing here is that there's um it's one of those things that you the the, the, the more you read the harder it is to sort of see what what might be you know something approximating what the case might have been on the ground is that there's there's certainly um you know there's certainly a lot of affection and respect for the ottoman sultan um in egypt and you know we know this like with the deposition of abbas hilmi and you know the the, the writings of various senior egyptian you know, like elite egyptian um uh, figures but it's it's that and and i'm talking now outside of our sort of regional area of this talk from my knowledge of um you know south asia is that you have this you have this yeah this affection respect etc but it doesn't translate into action um and i think this is where again going back to the sanusia and their relationship with the ottomans it's it's where that that particular story of that, that relationship becomes really important because it's not like the ottomans are um coming out of nowhere they've had this centuries old presence and they've kind of revivified reasserted their imperial presence since the late 19th century so by the time we get to 1915 it's not really it's not that surprising that you know when the ottomans have the chance they get sent they decide to go back on german submarines and pitch up in 
the North African coast and start engaging in these in these relationships. So yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, I wonder if we have any other questions. Uh, please, you know, jot them down now. Um, otherwise, uh, I'm sure that if if um, if you reach out to to John from by his uh, Open University profile, he'll be happy to to respond. Um, it's the last of our series on. Um, I, uh, hold on, I'll put your email in. That was just. I'll put your email to the chat to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So this is John's email. Should anyone want to uh, follow up on this talk? This is uh, the last of our series with the Society of Libyan Studies. However, I'm sure it's not going to be the last of our kind of collaborations. Ah, there is a question that's come in um, from an anonymous attendee. They ask uh, whether you have a view, John, on how these events shaped subsequent conflict with the Italians in the 1920s and 30s. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think, you know, what we see here is that there's a sort of, um, that's fine. Um, I mean, because because there is a, you know, the, the, the Sanusia, they're initially, unsuccessful against the Italians when you have this first kind of wave of invasion in 1911-12, but then because they are successful in 1913-14, and then they are able to engage, even though the Italians are very hostile to this, they're able to engage the Italians essentially as equals diplomatically with the British, and the British are really, I think, more in concert with the Sanusia than the Italians um, for sort of inter-imperial competition. Um, like they see the Italians as, um, you know, I mean, they don't see them in the same kind of power political terms, if hopefully that makes sense, as the British. I mean, they see the Italians as a defeatable enemy. I mean, also the other thing um, that I'm sure we're all aware of, like the, the, the Italian defeat by the Abyssinians, Ethiopians at Adawa in 1896, this is an event that, you know, forget the outbreak of, the American War of Independence, the shot held around the world, Adowa is something which everybody knows about. They know that the Italians are a vulnerable European imperial power. And so I think this, no, I think this, um, I think this definitely shapes the conflict with the Italians um, in the 1920s. But also I think, you know, with the 1930s, when we see that decision by Mussolini to, um, you know, engage in this sort of extreme brutality of the pacification of Libya um, in relation to the lack of Italian colonial control, I think that is also very much informed by this history that goes back to 1911, um, because the Italians, they see um, not just the Libyans, but I think the Sanusir is this kind of um, force of order and organization that you cannot occupy Libya or in their terms pacify it effectively unless you you really um, you know it, this is not sort of a war of extermination but this is a war of um, exceptional brutality which is obviously you know then you see it replicated in in Ethiopia Abyssinia so so I think that's yeah I, I think again these to make a more general point, memories die hard, um, and and there's a there's there's a long memory. I mean, again, going back to the the, uh, the first question that um, Russell asked about the Ottoman officer Al Skari, um, you know, there there are people. Again, it's a question about periodization. There there are people who are deeply involved in what is going on in these areas before the First World War and the First World War and after, who are still active in the 1930s and they were either there at the time or they have very um, acute memories of what happens um, at the time. So I think this is, again, this is one of those things, um, it's very valuable taking the long view and again, looking at those, you know, looking at the careers of these people because that really does tell you um, a lot. I mean, yeah, just thinking about somebody 
uh, related to this, um, you know, the long serving prime minister of Iraq, Nouri As Said, um, who was met a grisly end in the late 1950s. I mean, his career goes back to what is going on in the First World War. So, yeah, I think that's, yeah, so that's a very good question. And hopefully I've given you some sort of answer. Yeah. And uh, the, 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 the person who posed the question, he revealed himself, they said that was David Atkinson from the Society for Libyan Studies. Okay. Um, he says that was a very useful answer. Okay. Um, I think that that is all of the questions, but uh, as mentioned, people can get in touch if they have something uh, that they would like to raise later. Um, as mentioned also, that was the last of our um, series on Turkey-Libya relations. Um, we have several events coming up on very different topics. Uh, I believe that tomorrow we have a a lecture which is looking at the safeguard the cultural heritage in Turkey and Lebanon. Uh, it's a full day workshop, the details of which are on our website, which is in the link in the chat. And then um, in two weeks time, we'll have a, we have a, another workshop, which is looking at um, cultural history in the context of the late Ottoman Empire. Um, you can follow all of those events by joining our mailing list or just keeping an eye on our websites or social media. Anyway, after all of that, I'll, I'd like to thank again, uh, John Site for giving such a, a, a elucidating and clear and eloquent lecture on this topic of considerable complexity, as we've heard. Um, and I hope that uh, everyone who joins um enjoyed it also um i suppose that that's that's all from me thanks see you at the next one <laughs>